right buddy, it's Joe Pryor from the Ladies Working Dog Group. Are you feeling stuck with your gun dog training? Trust me, you're not alone and that's exactly why you need to be here. Every week, we'll bring you the best tips and hacks to make training your gun dog easy peasy. We'll keep it straightforward, no fuss, just actionable guidance that you can put straight to use. So let's get started. Hello and welcome to another episode of Found It. Fetched it. This week I am joined by the fantastic Samantha Thornycroft Taylor, LWDG Group expert and behavioural trainer. How are you today, Sam? I'm really good, thanks, Joe. How are you? I'm all excited to be back at my desk doing loads of fun stuff. Um, and I wanted to talk to you this week about something that I think loads of our listeners will be able to relate to. And that is basically unraveling your gun dogs bad habits like where they come from why they're there so I wanted to start by talking about um what's the difference between you know the odd bark and it actually becoming a habit I think the main difference is does that odd bark get a reaction does it get something from you or does the dog find itself rewarding you know if they the postman is a really, really common one. So if your dog barks at the postman, ultimately the postman leaves because he's delivered his letters, he's walked away. So the dog goes, oh, brilliant. I barked at him and he left. Um, so, you know, then it can create that habit where he says, every time I see that person, I bark and that person leaves. And that then can roll on to, you know, next time I see the delivery man or I see someone walking down the street, every time I see anything move outside the window, I've then got this habit of I bark at it and it leaves. So it works and it's self-rewarding. Do you know, we've only been on this uh, podcast for about four minutes and I've already learned something because I've never actually thought about the fact <laughs> that it goes away, doesn't it? So it, 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 it shows the dog, oh, my, my barking here worked. I have done my job. What I wanted to talk to as well about is like, how do we know the, the warning signs of when it's turning into a bad habit? Like, what does that that look like? So we're talking here about the dog in the window. How do we know when these odd, odd one-off occasions are becoming a habit? Well, I think the biggest telltale sign would be, is it becoming more frequent? Um, you know, and if you can't, if so... A, the postman leaving is the dog is going, okay, this is working. But also it might be that if you were upstairs working or in the kitchen making lunch or whatever, the dog barked and you came rushing through to the front room and said, oh, you stopped that. And then you left again. But the dog sort of went, okay, I've got your attention as well. Um, you know, so if, if it becomes more frequent in its happening or if it starts happening with other things as well. So obviously we've spoken about that barking, moving on to different things, different objects and whatever, moving past the window. But if it then becomes a, you're sat cooking your dinner and the dog's in his bed and all of a sudden he barks, has that barking then transferred across to a different situation within your household and your daily life? As most people know, we've uh, invested, I shall say, in a dog for my daughter, which is one of these poodle crosses, cross what, I'm not really sure. I, I think we've settled on Pushon, and he is so yippy, and like having spaniels, I've, I've never really had to live with this, and this like, these barks for everything. So like, for example, he'll bark to go to the toilet at the back door, which I'm like, well, that's a good bark because you're going to tell me that you're not, you don't want to do it on my floor. But then he'll bark if he wants you to pick him up. He'll bark if he can't find his toy. You know, it's like it's a constant thing. And I'm very conscious of what you just said. But it is very easy to start um, responding to them, isn't it? You, like, not like, not like a child saying, ma'am, but a little bit like a child saying, ma'am, ma'am. So you look, you engage with them to find out what that bark was to begin with. Exactly that, you know, and it often stems from when you, or can often stem from when you've got your new puppy and you're trying to house train it, you know, at three o'clock in the morning, it starts whining and it's, it maybe barks. And so we go down and let it out because they haven't got a very big bladder and there's a high percentage chance in those first few days that they're going to need to go out in the middle of the night. So even in that instance, when we're trying to help the dog learn to be clean within the house, we're already 
going down that path of responding to the noises the dogs the dog has made which means that we're also responding to his attention seeking so what you said about your daughter's puppy just then you know yes he's learned very well if i make a noise they let me out to go to the toilet but he's also learned that making a noise gets your attention so he's more likely to do it it at as many different points of the day as he can and you're then left with that puzzle of what do you want and even if you don't know what he wants he's got your attention so his barking worked he's won without a doubt like i'm am i very conscious of what i'm aware of so for example if he's in the crate and he's happy and he's settled i know he's been to the toilet and i know he's at food etc and he barks i'm very clear with the whole family you do not open that door while he's barking because otherwise the bark means let me up the crate, etc. But it is very difficult on ones like I'm at the back door or I can't find my toy to think what is it like you just said that he's trying to tell me, you know, obviously he's not trying to have a full on conversation with me, but it is very difficult to know when we should acknowledge and when we shouldn't. It is. And I think, you know, in your situation, you'd almost be looking to preempt what you think might come. So look to see if there's any um, patterns of behavior that, you know, come through. It, does he start sniffing around the bottom of the kitchen counters before he moves to the back door? Does he wander around the house as if he's looking for something before he barks because he can't find his toy? You know, is is he putting those steps in motion or has he just learned that actually I don't really know what I want myself. I just know I want something. So therefore I'm going to bark. And I think the only obvious one will be I'm by the back door. I need to go to the toilet. But even that could slip. That could become the barking now only works when I'm by the back door because I want to go out. And actually I don't need to go to the toilet, but I want your attention. And I just want to go outside and I want to see the birds and I want to smell the cats and all the rest of it. So again you've got to be really careful that if you're if you're happy with a dog that barks when they need to go out to the toilet that it doesn't then slip into other bad habits you know the barking by the back door stays but it becomes for a multitude of different reasons rather than just that one i need the toilet now when i'm listening to you i'm sort of like uh, the listeners can't see this but i'm nodding my head and i'm like yes 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 and it is it is hard to keep on reminding ourselves of this. Uh, but like, obviously, I'm, I'm quite open and we'll, and we'll talk about Goose's barking. But I'm sure there's a lot of people, and I know from like talking to them in on direct messages and stuff, that they're absolutely distraught that their dog has picked up his habits. And they almost be guilty for doing it. But it's quite easily done, isn't it? It's very easily done. It's easy to slip into habits that, you know, sometimes it can start as quite acute behavior. So I know we've spoken on the dog and duck before now about dogs that, you know, as puppies, they used to climb up around the back of you on the sofa and they'd sit behind you on the back of the couch. And, you know, it was quite nice. And then maybe they'd get a bit excited. They start running around. So you giggled at them and you laugh and the dog went, OK, I've got a good reaction from this. And it's cute when they're a puppy. It's it's easy to fall into that habit. Of going, oh, he's going around the sofa again, you know, and we're inadvertently geeing the dog on. Yet when it becomes a fully grown dog and you sat there with your mug of tea or you're trying to have a phone call and you've got this fully grown dog that then is sort of bashing you around the head every time it runs past the back of you, it's not that funny anymore. But then you've got a dog that's learned a habit and you're now having to go right back to basics and change that habit. So we've just got to try and be really consistent and always think from the outset, anything you do in training have that end goal in mind. So you're, you know, is this beneficial or detrimental to what I'm trying to reach in the future? Yesterday I put up um, a reel and it was talking a little bit about, you know, like how long it takes to train, etc. And I, I wrote on it about the facts. And we talk about this all the time. Everything you do in the house, out of the house, on the field, in the car, it's all training time, isn't it? So for us, it's about being conscious of everything which sounds quite overwhelming doesn't it it does sound very overwhelming but exactly what you said every single interaction with your puppy or with your dog is an opportunity for training of some description you know and that might just be 
you that you don't want it to follow you to the toilet or that you want it to learn to sit and do nothing on its bed or that you're going to practice your heel work whilst your dinner's in the oven around the kitchen counter you know it can be anything but we've dogs are very clever in a lot of ways um and actually I, I read something yesterday and I don't wholly agree with it but I partly do and it said that dogs are inherently selfish you know they do what works for them and I think that is the bit that I do agree with I wouldn't necessarily call them selfish but I think they do what works for them what they find rewarding and we've got to tap into that and make sure that what they find rewarding is also something that we find rewarding rather than their self-rewarding behavior making us go gray at the age of 30. I think to a certain extent though we are all sat like selfish like if you think about it like um people who give gifts or give their time to volunteer or all those things they're not selfish in the in the perspective of this being a negative thing they get joy out of what they're doing and that's the selfish part like you know some people could say me sitting in front of the computer doing the work i do that's selfish because um i'm not with my children for example there's a lot of, of conversations about should you be a full-time mother, full-time worker, whatever that our conversation is. But I find joy in my work, but I also know that it helps my children. So I think sometimes the word selfish is used in a, a not negative way. But yeah, yeah, it is, isn't it? People say, oh, you're selfish. But I quite frankly think there's nothing wrong with us being selfish because it normally means we're doing something that makes us happy. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's it, it is another of those words that, you know, it's been perceived in a wrong way. There are many, many of, of those words going around at the moment, particularly in the dog training world. Um, but yeah, I think selfish, being selfish to a degree is good if it helps you and everyone around you in the long run. I think, you know, if you're selfish for solely you and you're not perceiving that it's detrimental to your dogs or to your children or to your family members, that's when it becomes a problem but by and large being a little bit selfish is probably a good thing and that goes back to our dogs doesn't it when they're being selfish and they are using that in a way to work with us that's fantastic when they're being selfish and they're bogging off 40 fields away because that's what they want to do that's where we get this sort of conflict of behavior exactly that so you've got you know your atypical example would be a dog that when you're out in a field and there's nothing better, it's doing exactly what you ask of it. Because in that moment, it's getting that reward. It's, it's enjoying what you're asking it to do. But then when a deer or a load of pheasant come into the field, it says, oh, uh, you're no longer as fun as that. I'll see you now. That's the dog being selfish in a way that's detrimental to your relationship. So that's where you would then need to put that correction in and say, now, hang on a minute, fella we're providing you all the fun and the stimulation and the engagement that you need over here and it is rewarding we need to make ourselves almost more rewarding than the exciting thing but also teaching the dog that going after the exciting thing and doing that self-rewarding behavior isn't acceptable so it's finding that balance do you think as well though like we, we talked a little bit briefly now about the fact that not that we are the cause of it because that's unfair but sometimes because we're not aware of everything, we encourage the behaviours we don't want to see. Do you think that like this in inconsistent behaviour on our part is, is where we need to focus first? Because it's very hard to explain to a dog that what it's doing is wrong, for want of a better word. Again, you, what words we use have consequences. But, you know, if a dog, for example, is running after a deer, that's what it's meant to do. It, it, it's meant to do that in nature. If it was wild, that's what it would do. So was it our consistency beforehand in teaching, like leave, etc., that sort of starts this off? Does that make sense, what I'm saying there? It does make sense. And yeah, I think it's that lack of consistency or the inconsistency is what's not taught the dog. You know, he's not living... 20,000 years ago, he doesn't need to go and chase down his prey anymore. Um, you know, I mean, I think if you look at a dog that steals household items, for example, you know, our inconsistency often comes in because when we're out in the field with a tennis ball or a dope training dummy, 
we make a load of happy fuss and praise when the dog picks an item up and it goes, oh, you're pleased with this. And it's more likely to come back to you and to share that item with you. And we can be consistent in building that behavior pattern out in the field. But then when we go home and it picks up the socks, the slipper, the TV remote, your glasses, so often the human completely loses the ability to be consistent as they were out in the field. And all of a sudden we start turning into this high pitched, shrill, cross human that chases the dog around the puppy, uh, around the coffee table. And I know I've spoken about this before, but then you've got the dog that goes, okay, you're, you're cross. I don't want to come back to you now. So they're more likely to start running away with that item. Um, and you know, if you snatch it off them, if you get too cross, if you, are too overbearing in your correction the dog is not only learning that whatever item it stole got your attention it's also learning that whatever item it stole you perceive as quite high value and that it's going to lead to you being cross with the animal so if you repeat that behavior enough times it could potentially lead into something like resource guarding. If the dog then is feeling that you really want this item and you're going to start getting, I can't think of the word I want, um, you know, a bit overpowerful and a bit overbearing about it, then the dog might go, well, hang on a minute, you want it that much, I want it that much, so actually I'm going to be protective of this item too. You know, and if, so you've almost got, well, a multitude of issues that have come in there. You've got the attention seeking, you've got the present potential for resource guarding but that also can then cross over into your training when you're out in the field if you said to your puppy in the morning of you got cross with your puppy in the morning because it stole the tv remote and then you can't work out why it doesn't want to bring the canvas dummy back to you in the training field in the afternoon you'll probably find that it's linked together and it's these connections, isn't it? Like it's about teaching ourselves to be aware of the consequences of everything because we are in a position where even the simplest things we do, because the gun dog is always learning, the simplest things we do that we think are completely unimportant become a very much a focal point for the dog. Do you think that the bad habits, they, they become almost, um, they almost affect the dog's well-being? So, for example, like you said, they pick it up all the time, we shout, we whatever, we say, give it, give it back, we get cross then the dog gets confused and lost, as in why we are upset with that in the house, but not in the field. We end up causing a, a large amount of confusion in the dog of what it is we actually want. We do, absolutely. And again, it comes back to that lack of consistency because one minute we're happy when the dog's bringing stuff back to us and picking it up, and the next minute we're cross when it's picking stuff up but not bringing it back to us. Um, you know, and actually we're creating the fact that it's not bringing it back to us because we're cross. Whereas if we looked at that situation and went, okay, you've got an item, which I quite like. I like being able to change the channel on my telly at night. So I want it back, but I have to be happy and consistent and encouraging and welcoming to my dog at that point in order to get the item back that I want. I also need to realize that I've either got to put it out of reach or, um, and this is the bit that you really want to do, is teach the dog what items are available to it and what items aren't. So look at it again as that training opportunity. Instead of getting cross and leading to more issues with your training, be nice, be happy, but then find that additional training opportunity. Teach the dog, leave. Teach it, drop. Teach it you know to do something else instead but so that the dog is still getting reward from making the right choices ultimately and those right choices are the ones that benefit both of you and therefore benefit your partnership moving forward so there's some habits that we've talked about which are created by us as humans by you know inadvertently but they are created by us and those habits then go on to become behaviors um but there are also sort of behaviors that we see that didn't come from a long a long list of, of us rewarding inadvertently rewarding something there could be an event that triggers something in a dog and then that becomes a behavior an instant behavior an instant response and we didn't do anything wrong in another way again using the word wrong but we didn't do anything to cause it did we 
yeah i think there are things that you know can just happen um ultimately i think most things do come back to the human it's you know we probably put the dog in a situation that it wasn't ready to cope with or it took us both by surprise um you know if you're taking your puppy for a walk and it gets jumped on by a big dog well we didn't make that big dog jump on our puppy and we didn't we don't own that big dog so you know it's training isn't our um our thing to deal with but by the same token if we weren't walking our puppy our puppy wouldn't have been there in the first place so i think it's it's there are things that can just trigger you know you can get a one event thing happens but by and large most things in my opinion come back to something the human did in the first place be it intentionally or unintentionally i'm a, a coach for a gentleman called jack canfield um and the first thing he teaches you is to take 100% responsibility for your own life. And he goes into it in quite depth. And a lot, when I first got like shown the idea or introduced the idea, I was like, what? It can't all be our fault. But it was a little bit like you just said, there is a set of patterns or consequences or choices that may or may not have led you up to that point. So, for example, you're in a bank and a, the bank gets robbed. There was nothing you could do about that. But what you can do is deal with how you deal with it after. But that's dealing from a human perspective. But from a dog's perspective, how they choose to deal with it, we cannot control. What we can control is how we choose to help the dog get through it, isn't it? Yes, exactly that. And it, it's it's almost going a bit psychological there, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but it is it is sort of taking responsibility for everything that's happened even if you intentionally meant it to happen or not you know it's still your responsibility to fix it or to resolve it um you know if going back to the the dog being jumped on by a bigger dog it could then become scared of big dogs it could become um reactive to other dogs um you know so it's then up to us to ensure that our dog realizes a not all dogs are scary b it was just kind of one of those things and i'm sorry mate but we're going to help you get through this and see if you listen to me if you um respond to me you know realize that i've got your back i, I am always out to protect you even if we end up in a situation that we didn't think we'd be in in the first place and this is sort of um the struggle isn't there like again I'm the first to put my hand up sometimes when I'm frustrated with the dog or something's not going right I I spend a moment or two in the victim mentality of oh I can't do anything about this my dog's never listening to me blah blah and I'll be the first to put my hand up to it but we've got to get out of that victim mentality very very quickly and, and look what we can do to change behaviors and certainly behaviors like reactivity exactly that i think it's instead of going on oh, my dog's always picked on or my dog doesn't like other dogs so i just avoid other dogs and you know this is really hard on me and it is hard don't get me wrong working with a reactive or an aggressive dog is hard work and it can be soul destroying and it can be exhausting um you know and i've helped owners through it and we've in the past taken on dogs that had those behaviors when they came to us and we've helped them through it as well so i know firsthand just how exhausting it is but we've got to like you said not play the victim in that situation and say okay it's now up to me to help my dog get through this to retrain a multitude of different things to go down a, a behavioral modification route but to change my dog's perception of other dogs so that he then understands through a series of um, training and everything else, he understands that not all dogs are going to pounce on him. He doesn't have to be reactive to them anymore because I've got his back and I'm going to help him through this process. And I'm going to teach him that, you know, I'm in control as much as anyone can be in control. I suppose for us, it's about like turning in the tide on, on something that's happened because we can get to a situation where we think, oh, this dog, you know, is no good for this, or this dog won't ever make this uh, or be able to do this. But 
But again, that goes back to us, like, not maybe checking that we've explored all avenues, isn't it? I don't, I wouldn't like to say that there's everything in the world can be solved because that's a little bit naive, but you can keep looking for the solution for the dog. You can. And obviously we always say you've got to work with the dog that's in front of you, which is why, you know, we don't give out like behavioral modification advice as a generic thing because it's not generic and even just training a new skill to a dog it's not generic you can't say if you follow steps one two three four and five you are going to get the end result because every dog is unique every dog is an individual so you've got to tap into what works for that dog and it might be that you've done steps one and two but then you've gone off and you've done 28 29 and then you've come back and done step four and five because that's how that dog works so that's what you were saying about you know making sure that you explore every avenue possible instead of just going well it's not possible you know and I can guarantee you that the majority of the time I, I'm not going to say all the time but I think the majority of the time there is a way to work through things with the majority of dogs Obviously, the best way would be to get the foundations right in the first place. But mistakes happen, life happens, work gets in the way, children get poorly, you know, things slip up. We realise we've created a habit that we, we didn't mean to, and then we've got to fix it. But you've got to do your absolute best and, you know, keep striving for that perfection in order to build a happier life and a happier dog, quite frankly. And I think some of that goes back to something we just said really early on is that sometimes people are ashamed of the problems their dogs got when like within our membership people are really really fantastic we we share there's no judgment there's no keyboard warriors you know ladies go in there and write every single problem they're having with their dogs and people are really really supporting really really helpful and i think that's how you find the answer isn't it because sometimes you might not have the answer yourself and it's only by sharing with a group or sharing with a behavioral trainer or sharing with someone that you're going to find a solution to the issue you're facing with your dog exactly that you know sometimes you've got to look outside the box as well um, and sometimes by asking lots of different people and getting their perspective on it you can then pick and choose the bits of information that apply to you obviously when we're talking about like behavioral modification the best way of dealing with it is to get a behavioral trainer to come and see you and to look at your entire situation as a whole and they then will have you know the experience or the benefit of the experience in order to to advise you on the best course of action um if you're looking at it from more of a training point of view you're struggling with teaching your dog to hold a retrieve when it delivers then it's it's better if you can get that in person you know one person's advice but if you can't for whatever reason if you're not able to go to a trainer and get advice then absolutely look online watch videos read uh, books anything to try and give you some ideas of what to try because if you don't know it yourself you've got to ask for help I think as well, a lot of people, when we start off, some of these behaviours are created from our lack of understanding of how all this works in the first place. Like we 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 simply don't think like this. So for a lot of people, the the um their life before their first gun dog was with pet dogs. And not that pet dogs don't have issues because they do, but the pet dog barking at the postman was not really an issue for anyone the pet dog uh the pet gun dog should i say barking at anybody it doesn't know when you're out on a shoot is the problem isn't it so depending on what the dog is going to ultimately do will depend on whether what it's doing becomes a problem for you i think so yeah and i think you know obviously everybody's ideal for their dog is different just as much as everybody's individual dog is different um, you know, and if you look at it from a gun dog perspective, if you've got, well, like you just said, you know, the dog that barks is going to be a problem if it barks on a shoot day. If you've got a dog that has an inability to settle, so you've gone for a walk on a Friday afternoon, you've met up with your friend you haven't seen for ages, 
and you, if your dog is then just left to ferret around the bushes to you know it doesn't disappear it stays within eyesight every now and then it comes back and it looks at you but it's creating a habit if it's repeated enough of not needing to sit still to not need to have any patience um you know that can often when you then get if you think about it from a shoot day perspective between the drives there is often a lot of waiting um and you don't want your dog then ferreting around the bushes or running across the field you know it might disturb the next drive so oftentimes particularly if you've got a dog that's new to the shooting field you'll bring your dog back to you you'll pop it on a lead well, if this dog has spent the last two years of its life thinking, I don't ever have to sit still, unless I'm waiting for a dummy to be thrown. But, you know, if, if mum's having a chat or if we stopped at a coffee shop, I can just mooch around and mind my own business. When you then put it on a lead between the drives in the shoot field, it's going to be getting a little bit ants in its pants. It's going to be getting twitchy. It's going to be, you know, why haven't I got this freedom I've always had? And that buildup of frustration can often then lead to other behaviours because it can't get that outlet by running around. It may well start making noise. So it might whine, it might shriek, it might bark. And again, you know, as we said earlier, that barking is a problem on a shoot day. So again, linking those behaviours back to when the dog was little, we went for a walk, we stopped, it, it just ran around doing its own thing. Thing. it's then become a problem later down the line when we're asking our dog to achieve its job um so we've got to always again going back to what i said earlier think about that end goal is what this dog in, and i am doing now going to be beneficial or detrimental to what we want to do in the future my old dog jess when you put on a lead and you stand on a drive would dig she'd dig with her front paws and I can remember one day, oh bless, I was, I was standing just like looking across the field. My father was behind me talking to somebody else and his dogs and my dog were like back to back, if that makes sense. And she was digging away and I didn't correct her, I just let her dig. And, he, and the next thing I heard was, oi! I turned around, his dogs were covered in dirt because where she'd been digging, she could have been throwing it back all over them. And I was like, Oh my God. But again, you know, at that time, I didn't know that that was a, a sign of frustration. I just thought she liked to dig when we stood still. But because you don't, you don't know why they're doing things. If you haven't got uh, a, an experience or knowledge in behavior and why that behavior is that way. Do you think that we have to have this attitude? Like, um, I don't know who said the quote, I'll find out and I'll write in the show notes how you do anything is how you do everything. Like I say that to my kids all the time. And I think it's something that we could use, isn't it? How we do anything with our dogs is how everything will be with our dogs. Yeah, I think that's a fair take on it. Um, you know, we, we can create good habits, we can create bad habits. So like you say, you know, how we do anything actually becomes everything. Um, you know, and it's, you said earlier, obviously, Jess and the digging and the covering your, your dad's dogs, you, well, you've said this often enough, you don't know what you don't know. So ask, um, you know, if you've come up against a problem and you go, oh, do you know what, I don't know why this is happening or I don't know how this is happening or I don't know what I need to do to fix it, ask the question, um, you know, and there will always be someone that will give you multitudes of answers. And then, then it comes down to you knowing your dog or having, a, you know, an experienced trainer with you that can help work out which which bit of advice is the bit that you follow. So sort of when I start uh, closing up the podcast, is there a line, and I don't know the answer to this, I'm asking you, and you might not completely know the answer to this, but is there a line where you can say, right, this is a training behaviour and this is a behavioural problem? I think there is, yeah. I think there, you know, there are certain things that just need retraining um and there are certain things particularly when it comes to reactivity or regression that or resource guarding you know all that sort of stuff that are actually better sought out through behavioral modification um so from a, a training point of view if you've if you've got the dog that has stolen your household item and it doesn't resource guard it then potentially you can just work through it as a training issue. You can retrain your dog. You can teach it to leave to start with and to drop, but you can also 
teach it that bringing things back to you and sharing things with you is a really really good thing and it's beneficial for everybody so that would be in the in the training park if you like if you've got a dog that this habit has been continuing for quite some time and actually they've started resource guarding with it then that would be better placed in my opinion to be a behavioral modification thing because there is a chance when a dog is resource guarding there's a chance if you deal with it in the wrong way or if you push it too far that actually you're you or someone else is going to get hurt and if it starts resourcing what resource guarding one item it could then go on to start resource guarding a multitude of different items um so yeah i think if if aggression reactivity or resource guarding are involved absolutely i would term it behavioral modification if it's just something in your training be it in the house or out of the house that has gone a little bit off path you can probably relatively easily redirect it with training does that make sense yeah so basically when when there's a negative emotional behavior response from the dog that is a behavioral modification job you know it, it, like you said if my if my dog had my keys and just wouldn't give them to me but there's i see nothing in the dog he's just holding on to them without an emotional attached to it that's very different to them showing me an emotional way years going back and seeing that they really don't want to give that thing up one is uh do you want this or don't you the other is a, uh, am not giving this to you and i'm going to protect it i think that's a pretty fair way of describing it yeah you know and it's um like resource guarding if if you try and sort of go i'm not having this i'm going to take it from you and the dog snaps and you leap backwards and go oh i wasn't expecting that very quickly some dogs will cotton on to the fact that actually snapping at you means they get to keep that item so in trying to resolve it you've actually made it worse and obviously the worse it gets and the more it is able to be practiced the harder it is to resolve so anything I think, yeah, I think your way of saying it is a good thing. You know, if it's got that emotional attachment, then potentially go almost straight to the behavioral modification route. You know, seek out a behavioral trainer, um, ideally a trauma based one, and just get that fixed before it escalates too far. Absolutely. So, for those of you who are listening who are members, there's so much training within our, our study hub. There's so many masterclasses, so many courses. We are here to help you. If you are struggling with something, please, you know, jump on Ask Ascending, jump on the live coaching, ask the question or DM one of us. Or, you know, we're here to help you 100% all the time. You are not in this alone with your dog at any time. Um, if you're not a member, as Sam said, seek out a behavioral trainer. There's a lot of people giving advice who maybe don't know enough about dogs themselves, I shall say. And that's not a thing, but if you're going to go and seek advice, go and seek advice from somebody who can actually do what it is they're saying you should do. I can remember somebody saying to me, you never take financial advice from a broke person. I don't know. I might have read that in a book, and I thought, absolutely right, I wouldn't. If you go and first go seek financial advice, you go to an expert. If you go to a business, uh, you know, grow a business, go and find an expert. And I think, Almost not that it's lost in dog training, but like anybody will just chuck something into the into the mix, like I don't know, just random stuff, and people go try in. I'm like, is that person an expert in the thing you're struggling with? And I think that's important, isn't it? Is seek out expert advice because, like you said, you can sometimes make something worse rather than better. Exactly that, you know, and we do see it a lot, and obviously everybody is an expert in their own opinion. Um, but it's finding the people who actually do you know they've, they've had more than a handful of dogs um and again i read something yesterday that um it was about aggression in cocker spaniels um and one of the replies on there was something along the lines of you never get aggression in a cocker spaniel i've had three of them and never have i had an aggressive bone in any of them um you know and i thought three three is not that many you know and uh, I mean it's it's almost a topic for a whole other podcast but cocker spaniels are actually quite high up there on the bite list um because a lot of them are working cocker spaniels that end up in 
a home that potentially they're not getting a good outlet for their drive and their desire and therefore it leads into behavioural problems. And then as well, we take on board the fact that again, even if you had a hundred dogs, you might never have had the dog that you have. So I was a spaniel the other day and I saw Gretchen in the spaniel and I thought I've never in my life. And I've seen double numbers of spaniels between my family and like I've done that. Never seen an aggressive spring spaniel, but I did. That doesn't, so, you know, it, I've never had to deal with one, so I couldn't tell somebody how to deal with one, if that makes sense. And like you said, and like this whole podcast has been about, you don't know what caused that behaviour in the beginning, you know. What has made that dog behave the way it is? And that is why you do need to bring the experts in when they are things that are emotionally uh, driven. Yeah, you know, and that, as I said before, that the, the behavioural trainer should take into account your entire situation you know the health the history the whys the hows the where's the whens um how your daily life works how you've dealt with it previously right down to how much sleep the dog gets and what the dog eats you know and and they will ask you questions that you may well think are completely detached and not relevant but trust me there is always a reason to why we ask these questions And having someone that has been through it, that has helped owners through it or been through it themselves is a good way of of ensuring that you can get the the problem resolved. Fantastic. Well, thank you uh, for putting the world to rights with me again on this podcast. For anybody who wants to get hold of you, how do they get hold of you? Uh, Thanks, Joe. So I can be found at either caninefoundation.co.uk or langwell.gundogs.co.uk um, and we're based in Gloucestershire but we do travel around so if there's anything we can help with please feel free to get in touch. I love these podcasts because we get to chat about things in a very different way to how we do it in the math classes. Math classes are very much how to fix something or how to teach something whereas our podcasts are very much more like why we do things or why things are that way and um, I absolutely love them. For anybody who's listening if you would like to join the membership we are open at the moment. The doors will be closing uh, shortly. We've got quite a lot of stuff coming up and we will be closing the membership for a little while, focusing on the members we have. So if you want to join us, please make sure you do so uh, quite soon. And um, for those of you who want some information or want to just try some of our stuff, just go along to our Instagram, have a little look there. There's lots of ways that you can access some of our free training there's also some quizzes there's loads of cool stuff on there that you can do too if you are one of our members we shall see you in the membership and see the rest of you next week that's it for today's episode a massive thank you for tuning in don't forget to head over to the lwdg and sign up for our membership get access to expert-led training a wonderfully supportive community and the resources you need to become a confident and skilled gun dog trainer Let's take this journey together because no woman should have to train her gun dog alone. We'll see you all next week.